Hello, everyone. As a director of the Africa Center, I'm happy to welcome you today to this important event around our task force on African creative industries. Thank you uh, to the brightest minds of this sector who have accepted to join this timely and critical conversation in alphabetical order uh, for the African Development Bank, Salomon Kenner, uh, Vice President of Private Sector Infrastructure and Industrialization, uh, for the African Guarantee Fund, uh, the CEO, Jules Ngaham, for Afrexim Bank, uh, Temwa Gonwe, Manager, and Dr. Fofak, Chief Economist of Afrexim Bank, for BIDC and EBED, uh, Dr. Madhu Badian, Vice President. Uh, for UNECA, uh, the UN Economic Commission for Africa, Nita Deapal Singh, Director of Publications and Knowledge Management. And for the US Chamber of Commerce, uh, Scott Eisner, uh, President of the US Africa Business Center. Uh, you already know some of uh, these uh, people uh, since uh, IFDB, Afrexin Bank, or UNECA, for example, were presented uh, by, uh, respectively, by President Adesina, Orama, and Vera Songwe already um, during our very first event on African creative industries, the Summit of Washington from the Smithsonian Museum of African Art last October. This event, around 33 guests at the opening of the famous FESPACO of Burkina Faso, was a turning point in the history of uh, our uh, council, uh, a, a, tr a true success. Maybe for the first time in a very disruptive way, we raised the creative sector, the most dynamic economic sector of the world at the highest level. And Africa is a, is a leader on this. I, I think we can say that a promising market on the continent where the most important digital revolution uh, of the world happened uh, these two last decades. Through fashion, music, movies, video games, arts, literature and or even sports, uh, the youngest population of the world is at the origin of a true African soft power. With uh, Senegal taking the presidency of the African Union, we will launch this program with the Sports Business Forum on March 4th. Uh, next month in the Museum of Black Civilizations of Dakar, a, another timely event a few days after the Lions' victory in football. By, the, by then, uh, here in Washington, it is, um, it is critical to figure out the most suitable and innovative financial engineering and mechanisms for uh, the funding of this sector. This task force is about money, about investment. Our goal is to bring policy makers and business leaders to consider the investment opportunities and in this promising industry and how to do this. One target, job creation for the young Africans. Uh, 12 million jobs per year are needed to absorb the demographic revolution in Africa in the next 20 years. We can find a part of these jobs in the creative sector too. To moderate this important and high level conversation, the first of a series of three meetings during the year, Please allow me to leave the floor to Mama Dumbai, uh, CEO of Sigma Delta Fund, uh, who makes us the, ho the honor to join our efforts of promoting uh, the African creative industries. As finance expert, he will lead this conversation with talent and inspiration. I let you enjoy this promising discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ambassador Rama. Yet, uh, thank you to all the panelists on this uh, discussion and all those institutions that actually came forward to uh, uh, meet us on this very important subject. The idea for us is really to understand what has been done on the sector uh, by starting first to define it and also uh, see what can be done more to uh, get investors involved. Uh, the private sectors involved globally, especially in the United States. So having investors in Africa in this field and see it as an engine of growth for our, our local economies. I wanted to start now that you no know, uh, the institutions we have in the panel with work session one. And the question we ask is how might we empower the creative industries to move more rapidly toward market development and investable assets? And uh, to open the floor, I wanted to uh, give it to Mr. Solomon Quena from AFDB, uh, just to answer uh, two uh, very simple questions. How do 
African creative industries fit in your global strategy? And what concrete program have you initiated in the field? I can maybe just uh, remind uh, the audience of some of the um, initiatives that have been put forward by, by the African Development Bank, namely uh, the Youth Entrepreneurship Investment Bank, uh, the, the incubator, which is called uh, Boost Africa, and uh, the Africa SME programs. Some of those programs uh, are very timely and very uh, interesting in the in the framework of this discussion. But I let Mr. Uh, Quenok maybe enlighten us on what the African Development Bank has been doing in the field, and uh, and, and 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 so Solomon. Okay. Uh, no. Thank you very much, Mamadou. I hope you can hear me clearly. Um, you know, the African Development Bank has really been focused on the jobs agenda because ultimately, what we want to deliver in Africa is you know, jobs for Africans, quality jobs uh, with, you know, uh, decent incomes. And, you know, there are two particular segments uh, that have probably not uh, been as empowered uh, and it's a big focus for us. And that is really, uh, you know, uh, gender, women, and also youth, uh, especially given uh, the demographic dividend, uh, you know, that Ambassador Rama mentioned, uh, because, you know, we have a youthful population and essentially we're headed towards 70% of our population being youth. Uh, unfortunately, we're not seeing uh, the youth who enter uh, into the job market, you know, every year, the 18 million uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, 83% uh, of them are not getting jobs. And, and, and as we take a look at the desperation uh, to cross the Mediterranean uh, for what is perceived to be better economic opportunities uh, for us, you know, this, this, this is part of the reason uh, we're very focused on uh, youth, uh, you know, jobs for youth, as well as youth entrepreneurship. And in addition, uh, you know, you know what we always say, you help, uh, you help one woman, you actually help the family of five, as opposed to one man where you may just be helping an individual. And so, you know, supporting our, you know, women entrepreneurs has also been a key area for us. And, and so, for example, we're working with Jules and, uh, you know, the HEF uh, to really roll out the AFAWA program. So it's really, you know, uh, you know, the entry point for us has been uh, a combination of trying to create jobs for youth and jobs for women. In addition, uh, our industrialization strategy. So, so the first example that I will share with you uh, is what we've done uh, on fashionomics. Uh, essentially, we spent a lot of time, you know, taking a look at the value chain, um, you know, uh, from cotton to textiles to garments from an industrialization perspective. It's one of the three industrialization, uh, you know, value chains that we have prioritized, you know, as, as the AFDB. Uh, the others would include things like the pharmaceutical sector, the fourth industrial revolution, uh, agro-processing, you know, as well, and, and supporting really uh, the gas value chain. So, so this, you know, so, so the cotton to textiles to garments uh, space is very important for us. Uh, fashionomics give us the opportunity to really focus around uh, both women and also youth uh, entrepreneurs uh, in that value chain. Uh, and, you know, what we did was mostly around uh, technical assistance and advisory work. Uh, we've helped with capacity building. Uh, we've helped also uh, create, you know, a platform uh, that connects, uh, you know, that connects, you know, MSMEs in the value chain, uh, you know, to do business, you know, with each other, to transact with each other, uh, to share knowledge as well. And, and we've done a, a lot of knowledge work, for example, in the jewelry sector, trying to understand, you know, that particular accessory and the opportunity in, in at least three countries. So this has given us great insights uh, and we've also helped improve, um, you know, a lot of MSMEs in that value chain, uh, you know, to actually be better prepared and we facilitated uh, access to finance, you know, through, uh, you know, commercial banks and other institutions. But what we need to do next is also, you know, provide some financial support uh, to the same financial institutions or innovative financial institutions going forward, uh, you know, to actually, put, you know, support the fashionomics, uh, you know, value chain as well. So that's, you know, that's one example. Uh, you know, the next example I'll give is more recent. Uh, we've been engaging with the government of Nigeria 
uh, that are very concerned really about youth entrepreneurship. Uh, identified, you know, two critical sectors where youth would tend to uh, have, you know, have really the entrepreneurship flair and, and, and businesses. And one is the creative industries. Uh, the other is the tech and tech enabled industry. Uh, on the tech and tech enabled side, we, we have, you know, you know, as, as the AFBB been rolling out, uh, you know, accelerators, incubators, you know, which have, you know, ultimately spawned, you know, the next generation of what we hope would be the, uh, the unicorns, you know, et cetera. Uh, but it's, it's really an ecosystem approach that we've taken on the technology side. Uh, and we would like to really replicate that really on the creative industry side. But the program that we have with, you know, approved uh, with the federal government of Nigeria, because uh, as AFDB, we can uh, finance governments, we can also finance private sector, uh, would ultimately stimulate, uh, you know, the creation of early stage private equity funds, uh, not dissimilar to, you know, what Mamadou mentioned that we have in Boost Africa, uh, but this would really be stimulated by the government of Nigeria, but they would bid it out, you know, to experienced uh, private equity or, or more so venture capital funds, because this, this is going to look to invest in the creative industries at a very, very early stage. And, and the model that's going to be employed there is a model that can actually be replicated, you know, to act, you know, to have a more U.S. investor interest really come into the space. Uh, so government will provide, you know, 20% seed funding. Uh, they could do it through a junior uh, equity crunch, you know, to really attract, you know, commercial investors on top of that. Uh, so this, you know, is an opportunity for U.S. institutional investors as well. And, 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 and that's also, you know, the second example of what, of what we're doing uh, in the creative industry space. And then lastly, going forward, uh, you know, uh, Mamadou mentioned the youth entrepreneurship investment banks. Uh, this, these, once again, are really, you know, financial institutions, but, you know, uh, they're going to be conveners of the ecosystem uh, necessarily, I mean, necessary to nurture uh, youth entrepreneurs. Uh, so ultimately, from the financial, you know, from the financial perspective, uh, you know, these, you know, national uh, entities, uh, we're going to pilot 10 of them, hopefully by the end of this year. Uh, you know, this uh, youth entrepreneurship investment banks have looked really at the whole life cycle of financing for youth entrepreneurs, identified the points of market failure. Uh, and principally, that's sort of early stage between family and friends investing and when venture capital comes in. Uh, so this youth entrepreneurship investment bank will would provide equity financing at that stage and ultimately create a system to crowd in venture capitalists to then take over before private equity. And the next point of failure tends to really be at the debt side when the youth entrepreneurs are looking to scale up because a lot of their businesses, you know, are, are, are more really, uh, you know, IP based. Uh, they, they don't have significant fixed assets, so you don't have uh, collateral that you know typically the commercial banks would ask for. Uh, so the idea then is that the YAB, uh, which is what we call the Youth Entrepreneurship Investment Banks for short, would then actually provide a pool of guarantees for 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 youth entrepreneurs who've come through the system uh, when they get to that point of really uh, you know looking to raise uh, senior debt, uh, you know to scale up uh, their businesses. And, and the idea is, yes, starting off, uh, we, we expect that the banks would ask for significant guarantees, but with time, uh, we, would, we would create a competitive you know, situation amongst commercial banks, and hopefully uh, that would begin to lower the amount of guarantees uh, you know, that would be required. Uh, these are, you know, these are uh, commercial institutions or development institutions that we're going to create. Uh, you know, financial sustainability for them is important. Uh, they're going to take a portfolio approach. Uh, we're not only going to look at high growth sectors, we're also going to look at the vocational artisanal sectors. So, for example, in Togo, uh, you know, the, the Mason, uh, the Tyler, you know, uh, working with them to really get a starter set and get their businesses going. I mean, so Mamadou, I just wanted to touch on really, you know, some examples, but definitely, uh, you know, whether we started off, you know, looking at the creative, you know, industry as, you know, a sector itself or, you know, whether we've ended there, uh, it's, it's really critical for us because of the job opportunities that it creates for, uh, for youth and women and, and the quality jobs as well. Thank you. Okay. It's a great description of uh, the actions that are taking place. And, and thank you very much, Solomon. 
Uh, maybe next, um, uh, I can give the floor to, to Nita Dear Singh. Uh, Nita with, uh, with UNECA, the Director for Publication Knowledge Management and representing Vera Songwe, the ex Executive Secretary of UNECA. Nita, I just wanted, before I, I give you the floor, remind I, our audience that we're really looking at creative industries um, on a wider scale. Like uh, we are speaking about fashion, movies, the music business, visual arts, literature, sport, and also tourism, cultural tourism, gaming, uh, maybe education, uh, and, and the theme park industries. So all this type of ecosystem is something that really contributes to, to, to the creative uh, industries activities. And uh, as a strategic partner to uh, Atlantic Council in this field, I wanted to know what is actually uh, your perspective on, on uh, uh, your strategic vision on, on, on this and uh, what are the concrete actions you've been, you've been uh, 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 taking uh, in this field. Thank you, thank you, and greetings, uh, everybody, Ambassador Ramayad, uh, distinguished panelist and distinguished guest. Um, as, uh, as you have said, you know, uh, you, at UNECA, what we have started uh, uh, doing with one particular um, partner is to support in the film and, and knowledge management creative industry. So because uh, I'm responsible at uh, UNECA for publications and knowledge management, but at ECA, we have uh, different divisions who are helping on the on the on their own level uh, in terms of creative industries, in terms of SMEs uh, for girls, for example. As you as you mentioned, you know, we in terms of uh, creative industry, it ranges from film, from recording, music, publishing, uh, even computer software uh, generation is is counted as creative industry. Um, and there's a lot to do, especially, I think, on the uh, women entrepreneur. And I was very happy to hear um, our colleague from uh, AFDB to talk about the Youth uh, Entrepreneurship Investment Bank, because as he mentioned, a lot of the failure point is the, not only the access to finance, but the scaling up. Um, so, uh, for example, at ECA, our Division for Gender uh, Equality has been working with uh, our technology uh, division to provide um, training on girls coding. Girls coding is important. We may not think about it as creative industry, but it is because today when we're talking about all these, um, uh, there, are, there are lots of people across the world who are making animated you know, movies um, and, uh, you know, which which is kind of the kind of the Disney Disney model. And there are lots of young people across the world today who are, co I mean, coding is at the basis of creating not only software, but little animated movies and so on. So there is a lot to do uh, in terms of um, the uh, STEM education, so the science, technology, engineering uh, education for uh, for girls, and ECA is actually on the ground uh, doing a lot supporting girls coding. I think this goes a long way. Um, on the on the finance side, I have to say that we are we leave this to the investment banks. So um, you know they are they are the experts. We are here to work in partnership with investment banks there's african development bank we also work with afrex in bank so um you know we can we can provide the, the 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 partnership because when you look at the value chain of the creative industry i mean any basic value chain the the pressure points are at the production level and scaling up the production i can give you examples that i know personally of, of women in madagascar who are extremely creative in all kinds of, um, of, 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 of things, but they remain at an informal level, at a very small micro level, uh, because one, they don't have access to the finance and the equity and so on, but there is also support in the value chain in terms of the production, 
uh, and the design. So I think in that sense, there is a lot also for all of us to, to be together to provide that kind of um, scaling up the design and the production for an international market. Um, yeah, so so the, the new financial models, I think, need to, uh, to, and it's good to hear from, again, from our colleague from the African Development Bank, but this youth entrepreneurship investment uh, program or, 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 or bank, uh, I think, should also come up uh, with innovative financial solutions. I think I started to hear some of that. Um, given that, you know, an Ambassador Ramayad uh, made mention of that, in terms of the demog demographics of the African continent, uh, we have, you know, um, a majority of youth coming up in the next generations. So in terms of having very innovative financial solutions, these youth, they are connected to the world. They see what is happening, but they are um they are blocked from the access not only to finance but as i said to the to 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 an international platform and, and the marketing and the design of the marketing so i will stop here I, I think i've taken a bit of time thank you okay no no this was very interesting so we'll come back to uh, matters of uh, education and also financing uh just continuing the round table I wanted to maybe give the floor to uh, Afrik Zimbank. Uh, she's represented by uh, Dr. Hippolyte Fofak, which is chief economist. Um, I've seen a very impressive program uh, on the creative industries. Uh, uh, and, 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 and this goes way uh, back to, uh, I think uh, some discussions I had like, Maybe five years ago, with some some one of your one of your staff um, was speaking about she actually about the field. It seems like there has been a lot of thinking about this field, and uh, I was very impressed with, with your project document. And I wanted to uh, to have you, Mr. Fofak, and I think also uh, African Bank is represented by your colleague Temwa Gondwe, who is the manager of the Intra African Trade Initiative, to give us a perspective on what you've been doing in the field. Thank you very much for uh, really uh, moderator for associating us to this event and really for to Ambassador Ramaya, I call her Her Excellency, for really being always a forward thinker and putting her head and mind on the most important thing that we have for the country. I think at African Bank for us is not just an economic matter, it's more than that. I think it is a strategic sector which has significant implications with positive spillover which go beyond economics and i think the whole issue of africans renaissance economic development will not happen if it's not really fully grounded within the culture and the creative and yes it has opportunity for employment creations job creations but it also has opportunity to actually making the made in Africa become real, making the commitment to actually embrace African product becoming real. It's also had the power of project, projecting Africa into the world and making up for many years of challenges, if not century, that the continent has been facing. I think over the years, the bank as a trade finance bank of the continent actually been involved in financing the creative. Just have to look at the export of basket weaving out of the continent. And we've been doing that for years. But there has been now a deliberate, a deliberate effort to really give a boost to that sector. And you'll be pleased to know that as a result of the centrality of the sector, our trade report in 2022 coming out in the coming weeks will actually focus on leveraging the power of culture, creative industry for economic transformation in Africa. I think it will be the first comprehensive report ever written on African culture to look at a lot of aspects, not just the role of culture, but also 
the soft power of it, the different products which have key potential for development and growth in the sector, the issue of how do we estimate the contribution of creative and cultural to economic growth so that they can become an incentive for us to actually support it. If the finance minister knows, for instance, that in fact this sector is contributed 10% to my growth, then it becomes irrational to mobilize more support for it. And this contribution of creative to, to trade, intra-African trade, but more generally, uh, global African trade is also something very important. And then the market conditions and what infrastructure do we need to make sure that those who are thriving in that sector continue to actually grow without any constraint or impediment. I think we are going to be looking into this. Of course, the financing is one constraint. I think the AFGB and Afrexim Bank will be addressing those constraints. And what are the policies? And this is where we work with UNECA to engage authorities on the policies that will actually create a conducive environment for those in that sector to thrive. And then the key issue is some of these, as mentioned earlier by Ambassador, are really in the informal space. Then how do we make sure that we begin to account for the creative in the balance of payment in national account? I think if we are able to do that, then we are entering a virtuous cycle whereby it becomes a natural driver. So in other words, it will be the, in the interest of every single minister or government official to make sure that we are actually part of this. Then now, another aspect that I would like to now mention what we are doing currently, it's really, as I said, the sector has become so important that in the short term, we put together what we call Connex Crea Creations, which actually Africa is being armed to really support that sector in the short terms. In that space, we actually, the film financing development facility will provide financing to the film industry. I think we all know the role that uh, India Exim play in the rise of Bollywood. I think we are hoping that Afexim will be playing that role as well in the rise of the, not only Nollywood, but also the entire industry. We have the music development financing facility, which is really targeting the music industries. And since those who are in that space tend to be in the informal, but also in smallholder, we're actually putting together an SME development program to actually support young African in that space. And definitely, I think it's going to be critical for us to also get into the venture financing. And we hope that through our FEDA, Fund for Export Development, be able to actually provide those type of financing to ensure that no longer in this continent will great idea die because of a lack of financing. I think Africa Zimbang on the prison ram will make sure that all great ideas actually thrive in our space. Thank you. I see okay. that you're very anxious, anxious to take over the mic. Let me give back to you. I have a follow-up question for you. I'll, I'll, I'll ask it after the round table. Uh, and and I, I think on our, on our initial introduction, uh, I, I, will, uh, I wanted to jump next to um, the BIDC a bit uh, with Dr. Mokbajar. I keep uh, African Guarantee Fund just after, and the US Chamber of Commerce will come just after. So, so um, uh, Dr. Mabubajani, um, I wanted to know from you what, what is um, EBIT's perspective on, on creative industries? What have you been doing in this field? Uh, and what is your, your, your vision of it? Yeah. Okay, many thanks, Mr. Mbai. And uh, please allow me first to thank uh, Ambassador Rama, as everybody has said here. It's a, you know, it's, it's a really great seeing, you know, her organizing this event. This is very important events. Although at uh, ABIT, we are in the early days of looking at the creative industry, but I will take you through what we are currently doing and the journey that we have so far. I would start first by defining in, on our, in, on our, term, uh, in our terminolo terminology, what do we mean by creative industry? 
because it's, it, will, it, will, it will show you how, what strategy we are putting together in order to, 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 to consider the different financing strategies of the you know, investment vehicle and financing vehicles that we are putting together. Everything related to advertisement, architecture, art, craft, design, fashion, film, music, performing art, publishing, R&D, software, toys, games, TV and radio and video games. This is basically the universe what we define by creative industry. Now, wh where I would like to, 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 to basically, if you allow me, wear what I hold, my real banking hat. If you wanna make or finance this industry in the most sustainable manner, we need to find ways such that every dollar that goes out, the probability of coming back is very high. The reason why we have divided this, these various sectors that I have mentioned to you into clusters. And now today, uh, the, 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 the music and event business is one, 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 one big sector, but, uh, uh, and, and, you know, the, 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 the design and, 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 and craft is another big sector. And here's our colleague from African Development Bank, uh, if I understand correctly, Mr. Salomon mentioned, we are looking correctly at the end-to-end -end textile industry for, from, from cotton to the fabric and even to the, to the latest design of the clothes. And currently we are working on two big transactions in Togo, uh, and we have been also working something with uh, with uh, with a francophonie in a, in a, in Burkina, where we basically help from cotton, you know, to the transform to you know to the to the gaining and winning of the cotton to the fabric, and also supporting the end designers. But what we are also doing is working with, let's say, some relatively uh, handed or crafted guys. You know, once they secure offtake international offtake contract. We run one extra money and giving them, let's say, working capital, you know, uh, 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 and facilities and, and, and LC discounting facilities in order to 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 get the, what they what they what they have to do to get to get the job done. Uh, 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 now, uh, regarding the, the the TV and the radio, as you know, we are, we are, we are currently also in very very advanced conversation with certain countries in the ECOWAS region to basically bring the digital TV platform. Because as you know, some of these uh, countries are still on an analog uh, platform. And, and, and this is something that we, that we are pursuing very, very aggressively. aggressively. There are certain sectors that I would say, like the games, which, uh, which, which is relatively, uh, 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 let's say, challenging to finance. But uh, depending on how, let's say, the organizer of the event the organizer of the big mega shows are, let's say, are securing these cash flows through sponsor. Depending on the certainty of the underlying projective cash flow, we are also we we can also do some gymnastic some 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 gymnastics there. Now, and, and I'm glad to to hear uh, the, the, our colleague was mentioning those ladies in uh, in Madagascar. In my former life, when I was in trade and development bank, I supported a couple of women. Uh, and uh, there is a I don't know if you guys uh, there is a there is a the, there is a, the, the son of the uh, uh, industrialist Elias Agbarelli, the daughter of the industrialist uh, Elias Agbarelli, who did an, an amazing platform recently in uh, in, in Cannes. Well, but all those things, you know, although it is great, but the major, let's say, challenges for banks like us is basically the certainty of the predictive cash flows. The reason why I think that the work that banks like AfriXM is doing, and I recently follow what they have done in Portugal with with on the on the fashion side is something that we 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 need pushing. But if there is one note of caution that I would like to 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 say, if there is a, a thing, if you want to do this properly, let us make sure that every dollar that we put in, the probability of getting it back is relatively high. It does not mean that we should not take risk to support those industries, because if you make any mistake in the beginning, it might it might it might hinder things coming back. Now, uh, one sector where we are very, very bullish is on in the software uh, sector. But uh, but the software sector, we are linking it. We are trying to link it to what I call traditional industries. What do I mean by that? For example, you go to Nigeria, you have allo tractors, right? We are basically where we basically the guy design, you know, a, a, a software, a digital platform where to support the agri sector end to end. In this kind of you know, for this kind of uh, let's say venture a bank like us is significantly considering you know uh, you know supporting those guys Be and, and 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 beyond that because we are giving the farmers the seeds the fertilizer the chemical and basically we are basically we are basically plugging 
that software developer with all the required financing to develop whatever software you develop with the underlying, uh, let's say, uh, 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 off takers or software users uh, by basically discounting the future cash flows in order to give them the seed capital they need, they need to, they need to, they need to, 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 to basically develop what they have to develop. Okay. Uh, this is basically, these are, let's say, uh, in summary, what we are trying to do and what we are currently doing at the Ecos Investment Development Bank. And again, we, we are more than happy and willing to, to partner with people like African Development Bank, uh, you know, African Exim Bank, to have more critical mass in order what we would like to do. Thank you. That's, that's the point of this. Uh, meetings is to link up the, your different organizations and 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 find a, a structured way forward uh, to 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 uh, uh, make it easier for all of you to to better work together and uh, push for very interesting initiatives. Uh, I want to jump back to to Jill Ngaham. Gana, Jules, uh, we spoke last week, and, and, and Jules is the CEO of African Guarantee Fund, uh, a very uh, interesting institution. Uh, you know, for investors, uh, international investors looking in Africa, the perception of risk is something which is uh, uh, very important. And this is, there is a particularity in, the, in Africa, which is when I used to work uh, uh, in international market out from London, we call that the, the African bias, meaning uh, there's a perception that Africa is more risky than uh, its other international counterpart, which is sometimes obviously uh, not really the case. Uh, African Guarantee Fund is an institution which uh, actually is active on that uh, guarantee field. And I wanted to have your perspective, Jill, on how we can better help the SMEs in the creative industry uh, access to finance, and what is your 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 your, your perspective on, on on this question? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mamadou. Yeah. So first of all, I'd like to say thank you to the ambassador Rama for inviting uh, AGF to this uh, task force. No, AGF. Our main mandate is to bridge the SME financing gap, as you already said and EFGB, so the African Development Bank is one of our founding uh, shareholders. Yeah, so I work uh, very closely to the VP Salomon and we get a lot of support from him yeah, to be able to implement uh, our different product. You know, when we talk about investment uh, in SMEs, in the creative industry, I think there are, there are two factors that are very critical that the investor, will, they will always look at. We are talking about the return, uh, and the risk. So the role of ADF uh, is to share that risk with potential investors, you know, uh, to make sure that uh, uh, to make sure that we give them more comfort when they want to take uh, an investment decision. So basically, we do we have two types of product: product to share risk, so the, the risk sharing instrument, and we do also have a technical assistance uh, product. So when uh, it comes to risk, what we always try to assess is to understand what are the gaps leading uh, to, the, to the excess risk. You know? And then what we have been able uh, to identify is that there are mainly uh, six, six gaps that will lead uh, to, the, to the excess risk. And then all our products are designed to tackle uh, each of those gaps. So the first gap is the information gap is mainly due to the fact that you know financial institutions to be able to issue a loan to to an sme they need to be able to do a proper risk assessment but you know due to the due to the lack of information uh to the fact that most of the sme they don't do a proper bookkeeping is always difficult you know uh to for for the financial institution to be able to conduct a proper risk assessment we have the resource gap and that will be mainly the mismatch between uh, the needs of the SME and the resources of the bank. You know, most of the time to grow the SMEs, they need more of a long-term resources. When most of the banks, sometimes they can only give, they, they, don't, they only uh, have short-term resources. Yeah, so we also work together uh, with the banks, with the financial institution to see how we can bridge uh, this gap. Thirdly, we have the collateral gap, you know, uh, the collateral kind of requirement coming from the bank can be sometimes very tough. And most of the SME, I would say even in the creative 
uh, sector, they will not be able to meet the requirement uh, coming from the banks. We have the skill gap, we, we, which is also a very important one. So this is where now we work together with the SME to see how we can enhance their skills to give also more comfort to the bank or to the financial institution on the way uh, they can manage that body. Because you know, those SME, uh, most of the time, they are really struggling to attract the good talent. You know, most of the talent, they will prefer to go and work for a big organization. They will not go and work for a small SMEs. And because of that, it just increase uh, the skill gap uh, at the level of the SME. Another gap is the product gap, is the fact that sometimes the product are not very adapt to the need uh, of the SMEs. And also, as you mentioned, lastly, is, is, is the perception gap. You know, financial institutions believe that SMEs are very risky. And then when you are all, and when we are when you are an African SME, so you have like uh, two perception gap. The fact that you are Africa is a riskier com uh, is, is kind of the riskier uh, 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 continent in the world as perceived, and also now the fact that you are an SME, people believe that uh, it's a very uh, kind of risky sector. Now, when it comes to the creative industry, you know, at ADF, uh, we have been working with, with many SMEs in that sector. And then the challenges that uh, we have identified, I would say, over the last uh, 10 years, I think we're mainly coming uh, from, very, from various sources. One of, I think, I would say the, the first challenge that uh, was one of the most difficult one was the valuation. You know, the valuation uh, is really a challenge. When you take the creative industry, you know, uh, apart maybe from the art uh, and the craft sector, most of their assets are intangible. And for the banks, it's, it's always a big challenge to be able to value uh, uh, what all those assets worth. So I think, and, and, and where it's very critical at the moment is to see how we can put in place a model, you know, a model to be able to value uh, all those assets when it comes uh, to music, when it comes to all those uh, products or services that they are delivering that are intangible. How do you uh, come up with a, a, a clear valuation, you know, to be able to say, okay, in case those SMEs, they are not able to pay back the loan, what is very critical for the banks is that now, if we size maybe their asset, how much can we get out of it? Now, you have all this music kind of record. What will be the value you know, of uh, all this asset? And one of the main, main questions that most of the financial institutions always raised was the issue of the piracy. You know, They say, okay, those assets, maybe they have a value, but now how do you take into account the fact that we have maybe piracy that can reduce uh, the overall value uh, of those assets? Another challenge uh, is the informality, you know, most of the SME, because they are quite small, you know, all these uh, people that are involved in art, uh, in craft, uh, sometimes uh, in music, in fashion, they are part of the informal sector. So the challenge is now, how can we formalize, how can we help uh, those small businesses uh, to be more formal? Another challenge that we have that we identify also as well. Let me just jump in there. Let me just jump in there because you that goes to right management and 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 the way to to protect copyrights in the in in in, in the art sector uh, following sectors. And what you're speaking about valuation uh, raises also another question because when you value something, it means there's a market for it. Do we need to set up a secondary fund uh, that would be basically a buyer of last resort of assets uh, on the field that are in the process of development? You know, those are the kind of ideas maybe we can uh, uh, complement on the discussions uh, later on. But I wanted to give you just the opportunity to conclude quickly so that we can jump on to um, uh, our, uh, our, our next uh, panelist. Yes, yes. So to conclude very quickly, the last challenge was the challenge of the middleman. Uh, it was to see also how across the value chain we can reduce the number of intermediaries because we realize that most of the time the SMEs that are involved in this sector, they don't have access to the end consumer. You know, and in the, in the value chain is the intermediaries that extract most of the value uh, uh, of their product. You realize that sometimes the SME at the end of the day, they get less than 10% of the value of their product and 90% is extracted by all the intermediaries. Yes, yeah, so I will conclude there and say, 
Our product, uh, our services is mainly to be able to tackle uh, each of these gaps and challenges. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jules. And uh, I think um, it's going to be interesting to hear the perspective of uh, 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 the USA uh, uh, with uh, Scott uh, Eisner, who is uh, uh, the president of the US Africa Business Center, uh, the US Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Scott, actually, I'm going to uh, work with you the transition between session one and session two and ask you the two questions. Uh, how, how, what is your action and perspective right now on the creative industry? Uh, if you uh, have been working on this field uh, at the US Chamber of Commerce and how do you see uh, we can grow this industry and the flow of business between the USA and Africa and maybe increase it? Uh, a significant uh, multiple. Uh, what are your ideas on, on, on this? This will help us actually make a transition between uh, uh, our, our two sessions and we'll come back uh, uh, later on in the discussion to speak about you know the, the concrete ideas that can be put, put forth. Excellent. Well, thanks very much and thanks to Atlantic Council and Rama and everyone else that uh, joined us for the discussion today. Really, it's a critical time, I think, from a U.S. perspective, which is where the U.S. Chamber of Commerce might sit. I'm kind of the odd person out in the discussion today where you have banking and financial experts, and I'm more of a, a lobbyist or a policy advisor. But what's going on in the African creative industries and the opportunities that it's presenting in its largest definition for American investors, for American consumers, is transformational. Um, it's attacking a number of the issues that were raised, and I think Jules hit on a number of really important things around perception, risk, valuation of assets. But I'd say over the last five years, it's been really important um, and, and truly transformational to see how American investors are valuing and investing in African creative industries, whether you look at uh, Maven Records from a number of years ago, large American investment house came in and helped to support them and grew their grew their uh, you know, spread across the world um, so, so more and more consumers can understand the value of African-generated music industry. Or you look what Disney's been doing, the re recent acquisition of, uh, of, a, of a cartoon out of Ghana or Lionheart on Netflix a number of years ago. Um, even today at the Oscars being announced, you had an Ethiopian Mexican uh, director who came out with, uh, with a, a short film on chat industry in Ethiopia. Um, so they're starting to get that acclaim and it comes back to that perception and valuation issue. One, it's critical that we see more and more African born directed, acted films, um, reaching shores, not just in the United States, but around the world to change the perception. I think, uh, many ways the U S how they portray Africa, uh, over the years has been atrocious to say the very least, whether it's, um, media reports where it tends to be in the United States from where I've born and raised uh, of humanitarian issues of famine of drug trade of wars and other things when the reality of we know um, as investors and people are in these markets that it's just like operating in Los Angeles or New York there's vibrant economies there are people that are changing the landscape of how business is transacted how uh, how next generation technologies are being adopted and really, you know, raising opportunities for such a large youth population to come to the forefront, which I think is important for the creative industry. So, so for one, it's this changing perception, right, that we in the United States have to work with and partner with African institutions, whether they be in the educational sector, in, in, in large markets or smaller markets, to support the growth of the creative industry. Um, like I said, whether it's in the music side, whether it's in fashion, or in the movie industry, we've seen a large growth of, of movies reaching to American shores and American audiences through Netflix and through uh, ATT, Warner and others that are either uh, directing and producing films on the continent that are raising you know, the craft industry, opportunities for SMEs to engage and to grow the job sector for really highly skilled technicians when it comes to film and music production. There are these great opportunities for partnerships across lanes. But I think the valuation of the assets, as our previous speaker talked about, is one of those things that is really going to drive um, the opportunities for Americans to put a book value. And how do you account for those types of opportunities around the margin? So seeing you know, transactions in the cartoon industry or animation in Ghana or seeing the Maven Records examples, 
are helping to put a floor at least on where future investments could go, which will then bring you know a, a, an American community of investors that are a wash in money right now with you know cold hard cash to the shores of the continent and willing to invest and partner in the intellectual growth and the capacity. I do think setting the right policy environment as we transition to how does the business flow generated by the creative industries between the US and Africa become more sustainable and, ten, uh, and grow tenfold? One is predictability of the markets. So understanding everything from power generation to intellectual property rights as generators for the creative industry have to become a little bit more predictable um, across a wide swath of markets. It can't just be Nollywood, South Africa, and Kenya generating, you know, the lion's share of, of, of creative industries. We've got to look really beyond those, those three pillar markets um, into how that, that functionally expands. We need to see more predictability in the incentives that governments are placing on the industry to help draw attention on the production side, at least. I know in markets like South Africa, um, the tax credit system for production is really unpredictable at times. You know, one production will come out into the field and, and look to see that they're going to be able to bank a couple million dollars or a couple million rand worth of tax, tax credits and incentives to produce there. And then they go apply for those credits to be um, given back from from the from the authorities and they're not given. So on any film, it really varies from time to time. I think what's not being taken into account as part of the industrial growth is what are those companies doing in investing in the continent to grow the the skill set of African uh, you know production houses, studio editing, uh, you know the 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 fashion industry through textiles and development there where there's production houses. and we can utilize, my last point being, we can utilize AGOA in a slightly different way when it looks towards exports to the United States from the continent to perhaps include the creative industry in a more meaningful way, which I think has been overlooked for quite some time. But those are some initial thoughts on how we can help to grow the pot and make it more predictable for investors from the United States. Okay, thank you very much, Scott. Uh, I have another additional question for you uh, later on in the panel. I just wanted to to to, to jump to a, a question which has been uh, asked by one of the uh, one of the members of the audience, uh, Patricia Francis, about uh, the status of intellectual property rights. Um, what do you think is the landscape of that? When we spoke uh, last week, Solomon. I gave you an example of an artist in Senegal who's actually going to register his work uh, with uh, SASEM in France to get protected. Uh, do we have to work on the landscape of both business so that we can make them more bankable, more investable? Uh, taking the example of a music business, what can be done with the help of uh, our different uh, development organizations to build a strong framework for intellectual property rights. What, 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 what do you think would be the, the road to, 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 to boost that? Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mamadou. Uh, it goes back to the earlier point I made when I said uh, we could learn really from the incubate to accelerator model. Uh, we, we have to look at things from an ecosystem approach. You know, access to financing is not the only challenge, uh, as uh, you know, as was well articulated by Jules. Because uh, ultimately, if the intellectual property, which is an asset, you know, uh, the film library, the music library, uh, which tends to have value uh, in the U.S., if it doesn't have similar value, uh, you know, in, in in Africa, then people who understand the space are not able to adjust. You know, they are. The investment criteria to you know to fit Africa. So so maybe I, let me let me probably expand on what we're doing in Nigeria, and then it will give you a better sense of the ecosystem approach, which also uh, seeks to address the intellectual property rights issue. So as we look at you know working on the creative industry as, as you know aspect in in Nigeria, uh, the idea is that you know. We're looking at market development. You know, the more abadus of the world, you know, the uh, uh, you know they are able to have the right relationships with Sony, Netflix, you know, etc. The right offtake relationships, and they probably don't need financing as well. But ultimately, if we're looking at really the potential of that space, 
We need to think about you know, the lowest common denominator and the early entries into the market. So we've got to assume that, for example, you know, some of the youth entrepreneurs would not have the capital to be able to acquire the right digital camera, the right lighting system, et cetera. So part of the program we have in Nigeria is we're going to actually establish you know, studios. And, and this would be government working with private sector through a PPP structure to establish studios. Likewise, you know, uh, you know, the idea is to establish uh, a tertiary and vocational training center, you know, as well, uh, you know, for the creative industry space, similar to what AFCA has done in Africa, in South Africa. Uh, you know, that's the School of uh, African and Drama Arts. So a potential partnership with AFCA, uh, you know, could be possible. Likewise, you know, we're going to look to address the intellectual you know, property rights, you know, situation. So a lot of these are really working with government, not just to finance, you know, infrastructure on a PPP basis like the studios, uh, but also for them to create the right enabling environment for value, uh, ultimately to, you know, to, to actually go to, uh, you know, the original producers. Uh, and, and, and then also, you know, the concept of, you know, using the studio is, is also around clustering. So all of a sudden, you know, uh, you know, a, a film producer doesn't really have to own all their equipment. They can go and lease space, and they can still produce, you know, their quality, uh, you know, uh, their quality production, and look to monetize it. So this also brings up infrastructure. You know, for those of us who understand, uh, you know, the film industry, we always know that that's, you know, the critical window in in making, uh, you know, those films successful is the cinema house. So do we yeah. have really the cinema house, you know, distribution infrastructure? So once again, this is what I mean by we have to take an ecosystem approach. It's about market development. There will be some players that, you know, only exist on the, on the commercial side. But some of us have to look at, you know, the entire market development and find a way to do it. Uh, and once again, we have to harness partnerships, you know, so this is where we work with AGF, AfriXM. Uh, great to meet you, uh, Maduba, you know, it'd be great to also talk to you about what you're doing in Togo. I mean, so that two plus two is five, you know, but, but you know, that's my long-winded answer to your question on uh, intellectual property rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Solomon. I wanted, I wanted to, to, to raise another issue, which is one of data about the market creative industries. And uh, I really wanted to raise this question with Dr. Fokpak. Um, because I've, I've seen into uh, your strategic document uh, some very interesting numbers, uh, the size of uh, the trade flow of cultural goods from Africa, which is uh, basically uh, globally very low compared to Europe, 35.3% for Europe globally, 0.7% for Africa. I wanted to know first, how did you manage to uh, collect those data and what do we have in place to have a better view on those sectors data wise because that's really also an issue with uh, uh, African economies and business sometimes we lack the data to be able to to measure and, and implement uh, uh, strategies which are uh, uh, really um, uh, effective. So thank you, uh, Mamadou and moderator, for that very important question. And before we actually get into the creative, if you look at the actual content of African trade itself, it's fair to say that we often say intra-African trade is exactly about 15, 16% of the African trade, but we know it's not quite the case because most of the cross-border informal trade is really not recorded. And I think we've done a lot of effort in terms of how do we actually measure that? And let alone, how do we account for that in the balance of payments? I think these are some of the issues that we are essentially facing, which have implication beyond the trade in goods, but also trade in services and the creative and cultural. So it's fair to say from your question that what we have are highly underestimated value of, let's say, the creative export or overall African trade. And we also know that 
something actually can be done. And in the sense of we have two problems, the issue of volume, but also the issue of price and valuation that we mentioned earlier. When you combine that, they will tend to essentially over increase the scope of underestimations. But increasingly, I think as we move toward digitalizations, we believe that there will be gradually the migrations of that informal space into the formal one when it comes to, to trade in goods and services. And for instance, if we use the African Pan African payment, the Pan African payment settlement system, PAPS, for instance, if you use it as a mean of cross border trade, you can see clearly that it will become very easy for us to gradually begin to account for it. So within the bank, we've actually essentially put a strong unit, what we call trade informations, which essentially help in increasing the dissemination informations. It's not just in terms of valuations, but in terms of trade as well. So that when you're in Senegal, you want to, let's say, engage in a particular commodities in the creative industry, the creative space. We know who is actually in that space, who is producing that particular type of movie, who's actually producing that particular type of architecture and future and so forth. And so we are going to push that from the trading good into the creative to make sure that we have enough information on African produced goods. And one of the key objectives that we have at on the Intra-African Trade Fair that we organize every two years is essentially to begin to close that trade information gap. And we believe that it was a major event in Durban, the creative. We believe that going forward, it should receive even more attention given where we are in that particular space. We'll make sure that we do more in terms of investing in closing the information gap in the creative. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and, and I think it, it's very important in terms of data that uh, we uh, have uh, organized an access to uh, uh, those data about the industry so that we, we, we also have um, a, a platform where international investors can have information because information is, is key uh, to, 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 to be able to uh, to clarify and qualify uh, investment decision. And this is not a job that can be done by somebody outside of Africa. It has to be done by, by, by our own institution. Uh, we have to understand the dynamics inside those, those sectors and be able to evaluate, uh, uh, evaluate the, the data. And, and really, we have now jumped into our second session. And, uh, and, and, and we are at the stage of thinking about or speaking about solutions. And uh, I'm gonna change the order a little bit for this second session uh, and, and, and really uh, maybe come back to, to, to Nita. And, 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 and Nita, uh, I wanted to, uh, so Nita Diaparsing, which is uh, from UNECA, uh, I needed, I needed to, to ask you that, that question. Looking at, you know, the, the business flow of creative industries, as we're speaking about business, and um, uh, I know that you, you are more on, on, on the policy side of it. What, 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 what do you think could be Unica's uh, uh, drive and, and, and influence to help us maybe better structure these creative industry sector in terms of policy making and make it uh, a more investable sector for 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 maybe global investors and, and, and or African and international and specifically US US investors. Thank you, thank you. I think um, at uh, UNECA we have a private sector division and uh, as of yet we haven't really dived into the creative industries as a niche or as a, as a focus um, uh, area of action. But the private sector division at UNECA could partner with any of your panelists here today um, to develop, uh, I think when we're talking about the flows of business between Africa and the US, 
I heard, I uh, was listening with interest to Scott Eisner of the Chamber, US Chamber of Commerce. Now, the challenge I think for Africa is to see uh, whether we can have a sort of a collective chamber of commerce. We are doing, as you know, the uh, implementation of the uh, AFCTA, the African Free Trade Continental Agreement, uh, but it is in the process of implementation. Now, can we, um, can we, can we uh, leapfrog? Can we leapfrog that and see whether we can maybe work together to create a platform of sort of pseudo proxy chambers of commerce for the young for the young people because again let us let us project ourselves 10 20 years down the road uh, because this is what we're talking about we're talking about the youth who are who are coming up and they may not be in the sort of the old kind of structures of the old uh, traditional structures of chambers of commerce and so on and so forth i think today we have to come up with innovative um equivalent of chambers of commerce which would be sort of a common platform and i i was thinking as i was listening to all the uh panelists is that you know this could happen with uh, the the financing institutions like the afdb and and afrexim bank um i in particular i'm turning to my colleague at afdb who talked about the youth entrepreneurship investment bank that ha could have a component of a of a cross africa platform which would be an innovative version of a chamber of commerce for the youth because we're talking about the youth here i think and let, let's be very clear and let's be very practical uh, and 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 that platform then could have the uh, exchanges with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. That's I think how you could really link the flows of business between uh, Africa and uh, and and the, and the U.S. and other countries, by the way. But but the, it should it we should start with that innovative mechanism, the innovative platform for marketing for people for these young entrepreneurs to come together and 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 market their what did they have to offer thank you thank, thank you very much thank you very much uh, nita um, and uh, I, I i wanted to 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 raise that question with uh, with dr mabuba jai uh, doctor um, looking at the at the landscape today uh, of the creative industries in terms of businesses and and knowing that you are uh, at the institution really uh, maybe starting to think about ways to 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 uh, to 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 uh, boost and, and and really support those sectors um what do you think is the key point uh, to focus on in the years to come uh, to develop and and and, and strengthen uh, the the economic development of uh, of SMEs in this sector Okay, uh, many thanks, Mr. Mbai. As I said before, right, uh, if you want this to be sustainable, we need to make sure that the, the people that we support, any dollars that we put in, the probability of getting it back is high. And also, and I, and I like the, the point that uh, Solomon mentioned, and also Nita also mentioned it, is basically building it in a way that, that's sustainable. If you if you if you look at deeper into the things, uh, maybe except Nigeria and a little bit South Africa, the other people just they just uh, take it as entertainment and not as a real business. Now, uh, if I see uh, there is a lot of uh, let's say requirement and there is a lot of need to do a proper capacity building to make these guys to think like proper businessmen. And, and, and I give you an example, right? Look at Senegal, where I come from. Uh, among the generation of Yusundu, today, I would say, except maybe Baba Mal or Ismail Olo, none of the other guys, even 30 years after, you even don't hear them. You don't even hear about them. Because those days, they just take it as entertainment, right? I go, I make a show, we divide the money and everybody goes away. 
and uh, and 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 now there is a lot of need to to make this guy to think like let's say a jersey to think like a rihanna and 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 say that this is a business we we start seeing it let's say from a, a, in a in a in a in a nigeria but uh, there is a huge need there is, a, there is i would even say a must to do capacity building for this guy to think that i am running a business this is number 1 number 2 and this is now where I would like to challenge with the bankers. We tend to be emotional about what we're trying to do by just creating a buzzword, you know, financing the creative industry. If we don't take this as a business, even if we put a $1 billion, we're gonna fail because we will not get that $1 billion back and we know it will be a waste and, it's, and it will fail. I think that if we do proper capacity building and also, uh, helping these people to monetize the downstream activities. What do I mean by that? And, 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 and look at wrestling in our country, in Senegal. Wrestling is, is, more, is more famous than, let's say, than, than football. You have seen almost what happened these last two, three days in Senegal when we won the, the, the African Cup has never seen, and my entire life, I have not seen it. But now, can you imagine in wrestling, if now banks like us, like African Development Bank, like Afixim Bank, even the local commercial banks, put, let's say, all our thoughts and minds together and say, guys, how can we finance this industry? We know that there are 10,000 sponsors down the line. We know that there are, you know, people, you know, you know, there are people buying tickets. If somebody, if a businessman wants to come and organize a wrestling competition, how can we finance it, right? And, and until we reach the level where, you know, it's like the NBA, where you have proper business people buying players, selling players, organizing events, organizing mar merchandise strategies, and monetizing all those revenue streams in order to pay back the bankers that are financing them, I think that we have a problem. And now I think that the sooner we do the capacity building, make these people think like a proper businessman, I think that we will succeed. And we, and we have seen that it's possible. Look at Houston do. He, he started with, you know, a simple musician, mm -hmm. turning himself into a tremendous success story, mm -hmm. owning television, organizing wrestling competition, you know, organizing, organizing mega tour, you know, and, and sometimes I can tell you it is self-funded. Sometimes it's almost uh, uh, funded by commercial banks, it's funded by insurance companies who can take, you know, uh, you know, even to act to risk on, on, on what they are organizing. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Thank you very much. You mentioned the banks and the banks, our local commercial banks are key. You know, they hold assets uh, which are in the range of a trillion USD, African commercial banks. And uh, they have to be put to tax of financing economic development of SMEs. But this is a task we, where uh, African Guarantee Fund uh, has been working with them to give them a platform I've seen in your project, uh, in your corporate brochure, actually, June, that uh, you have several windows. You don't really have, as of yet, a window for creative industries. Um, uh, maybe could you describe to us what could be added to your, your framework to, to, to better accompany uh, uh, companies which are on, on the creative field? And how can we put the banks also at work and better at least financing? Because that is something of an issue. African banks, they don't really do project financing. They, they do financing, but uh, they don't finance the project. Uh, uh, Mamadou, if you, if you don't mind, I can just quickly chip in, chip in, in this one. Hello, Mamadou? Yes, yes, quickly, sorry, sorry. Look. Uh, 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 I, I, I tend to disagree. When, 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 it, when, when banks say no, it means that the project ca projective cash flows is not certain in order to service the debt. And this is now where I would like us to remove the emotion about what we are trying to do. Because if we don't do it, we will fail. Now, you will tell me, how can we support those, let's say, artists, those creative event players, such that 
the projective cash flows that they will be putting on the table to service the debt such that when it, when it, when they come to banks the debt service the debt service coverage ratio that the banks are seeing are satisfactory enough for them to to put the money this is a challenge i, I agree i agree with you and 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 you know uh, i agree with you and and this is really um, live examples from really project that were finance even though like the project manager has done a good job of clarifying the cash flows sometimes he is asked some additional guarantees but thank you very much dr mavuba and and it is true that the work has to be done to convince the funder and the banks and our cultural banking environment is also something which is a a key a, a key factor that we have to work with and also make the banks more comfortable uh, doing real project finance and, 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 and company financing. So maybe we can come back to Jules. Jules, what, what is your perspective on that? As you have been really on the field in this sector and working with banks and, and, and investment funds to get them uh, more, uh, to, to give them more perspective and clarity on, on, on the type of risk they need to, uh, to, to, to be able to, to, to take in. And financing. Okay, thank you, Mamadou. Uh, okay, so I will jump uh, in one uh, the, the VP Salomon said earlier, you know, ADF again was an initiative of the African Development Bank. So and at the time, the vision of the African uh, Development Bank was to improve the ecosystem. We need to have two sets of solutions. We need to have a long term and medium and medium term solution and also a short-term solution. So the medium and long-term and long -term solution was mainly about enabling the environment. That takes time. It can take two years, five years, 10 years. So it's mainly about how dealing with uh, the lack of data, the valuation issue, the intermediaries, the informality, the piracy. That can take quite some time, you know, and all the policies. And then the main reason they wanted to support AGF was to deal with the short-term solution. The short-term solution is how do we offer some risk sharing instrument, you know, to be able to manage the current environment. Because when we want to enable, that is in the future. But in the meantime, we still have to manage the current environment, meaning what type of instrument we, we can provide to the investor to attract them in the current environment. So what you mentioned earlier about the window, you know, at AGA, we run several windows. So we have a gender window, uh, we have a green window, uh, we have a COVID window. So as we are dealing uh, with the financial institution, sometimes we want them to allocate a more important portion of their portfolio in a specific sector. This is mainly driven maybe by our shareholders, maybe uh, by the agenda of the time. But you know, it's very difficult to go and tell to a bank, I want you to do more of you have volume in the creative sector, do more uh, in the gender sector, do more in the green sector. The bank, they are mainly driven. What, what they tell us is that they are driven by two things, or they have to make sure that they meet the requirement of two specific actors, their shareholders and the regulator. So anytime you have to communicate with the bank, you have to tell them by doing this, this is how you benefit, uh, or this is how you meet the requirement coming from your shareholders, this is the profitability, and the requirement coming from the regulator, this is mainly the solvency. So we design our product to make sure that they can meet all those kind of requirements. So the window that we have internally, we find a way to incentivize the financial institution. I take, for example, the guarantee on AFAWA. You know, the most, uh, the most obvious type of incentive is the pricing. So we will tell to the bank, when you finance an SME, a normal SME, maybe you will pay a guarantee fee of 2%. But if you go to this specific sector, we give you a discount. So you pay less than what you should have paid for a normal SME. So this is the first way to incentivize them. The second way is mainly on the, uh, 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 on the portion of risk that we take in our portfolio, what we call the coverage ratio. We normally cover 50% uh, of the exposure because you want also the bank to have their skin in the game. So when they give a loan to an SME, we cover 50% of the exposure. In some cases to incentivize them, we tell them we are happy to raise 
our cover up to 75%, sometimes even 80% of their exposure. So they only keep 20% of the risk. Because of that, now they are willing to increase their lending towards a very specific sector. And also to jump uh, in what Dr. Jian was saying, you know, capacity building is also key. So it's also part of the incentive. Sometimes we complement the guarantee product with the technical assistance. So we tell them every time you go in a specific sector, what we do, we do a thorough risk assessment of the SME. And then we use our capacity building product to see how we can bridge all the gaps that we have identified during the risk assessment or the due diligence part to make sure that those SME are not going to default. Yeah, so we use all these various tools and, and even the last tool is mainly on the way we pay claims. You know, when the SME they default, we pay 50% of our exposure and then we do our own assessment to pay the remaining 50%. So to some banks, we tell them, if you go to a specific sector, any, as soon as you, you call a guarantee, we give you a delay of one week to pay our entire exposure. That brings more liquidity to the financial institution. So at the end of the day, what I wanted to say is what is very critical to us is to speak the language of the bank. We yeah. don't speak, when we talk to them, it's not to say, okay, it's good uh, to go there because of the development outcome. No, it's to see exactly how our product will help them to meet also the type of requirement that they have vis-a-vis their shareholders or the regulators. Thank you very much, Jim. I, um, I, uh, I, I think we, we have a lot of discuss uh, to discuss on, on, on this field. Mainly, I, I, I would have been uh, very happy to speak uh, with you about, you know, first- I wanted to actually uh, come back, please, if I may, moderator. Sorry? Um, I want to talk to come back on one important point that uh, Dr. Ndia made, if I may. Please, please, please Dr. Fobar, just, just a sec. I, I, I need to jump in and, and, and give the floor to, to Scott, who's going to leave us in a few minutes. So we come back to you just after. Uh, I just wanted to, 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 to mention that um, uh, the, the idea is, is really to find a way to uh, crowd in also US investment capacities. We're speaking about the biggest economy in the world. We're speaking about a private sector who has 3,500 trillion USD in investment capacity globally. We in Africa are really seeing a very small portion of that. Uh, and and uh, we have to work with our US counterpart to, to Im improve uh, that situation. Uh, Scott, I'm gonna give you the floor just to have your perspective on that. And, and one idea I wanted to suggest to you, and this is something that's going to speak to most of us institutions which are uh, on the floor today. And I wanted to mention also TDB who joined our panel and I'll, I will introduce just uh, a little bit later. Um, what do you think can be done by the US to support, to better support our African DFIs? Uh, with a condition that those DFIs uh, make a good job of supporting the development of the private sectors in African economies. You know, the private sector is a weak link, uh, really, in our economies. There's a lot of activities which are formal, some informal, but most of, in most of our countries, really, the main economic agent is uh, the government. How do we boost our private sector so that we end up having the kind of structure you have in developed economies, like in the US, where the private sector is really leading? Is, is, is really much way bigger than the public sector. And that's uh, a testament to the dynamism of, 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 the, of, the, of the economy. How can we, how can the US better uh, support the, the, the African Development Bank? How can the US better support Afrexim Bank? How can the US better support uh, African Guarantee Fund and other DFIs? Do we need to speak, for example, about another treaty with the African Development Bank, similar to ADF or NFT between the US and AFDB, especially targeting uh, the private sector, whereby the US would put funds uh, to, to really uh, back the development of a sector on conditions which are specific to that sector, 
can we find a US investment or development finance institution that could come as an investor to our Zim Bank on class D shares, for example, uh, or private investor to uh, African Guarantee Fund to boost the capacity of those institutions and make them better able to impact on the way uh, US investors, private investors uh, are, are going to be able to, to manage their, their investment risk. Those are questions I wanted to put to you before you leave. Uh, and, 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 and so I leave you the floor. Well, thanks very much. And it's been an enlightening panel to hear our friends from around the continent talk about the opportunities in the space. I think you know, the US is a big investor in AFDB. I think one of the things that we might want to look at is awareness for American uh, investors to, to actually understand what these African-based lending institutions bring to the table. Um, one thing I'd encourage AFDB and others to think about is putting an office in Washington. There currently is no representation on a permanent basis. And I think that's that's a missed opportunity because uh, you know our, our own development finance institutions are doing okay, but not great. The DFC launched during the beginning of COVID. I don't think it was really uh, hit its capacity at XM, has its funding constraints. I would say the unknown agency known as USTDA is the one that really has potential to have an impact in the creative space, um, especially as it drives more American exports and, and interest to the continent. But my first and, and last ask would be AFDB to reconsider, you know, putting an office in Washington or somewhere in New York um, to really make an impact on the investor community. I want to pick up on, on a couple of quick things I saw in the chat window. One, on AGOA and intellectual property rights. One of the tenets of AGOA is strengthening of intellectual property rights. And I think over the next uh, three years that AGOA is still in its current form, 2025, it'll change a little bit, I believe. But you know, how do we make the enforcement mechanisms around intellectual property strengthen African-based uh, intellectual property schemes to the benefit of the creative industry? I think it's something that needs to be greater analyzed to a question in the chat window. Um, obviously, the export of cultural goods and textiles, physical commodities to the United States under AGOA has been underutilized uh, by and large. And so I think there's another opportunity there. When it comes back to valuations and, um, and predictability of markets and who owns what, Aubrey Ruby, who I know is affiliated with the Atlanta Council, put something in the chat window about Web3 NFTs. It comes back to blockchain and ownership. I think there's an untapped opportunity here in, in Web3 and, and blockchain space and ownership structures that can drive forth understanding of the true value of products, um, whether it's an NFT, which I still have to get my hands around. Uh, um, but even beyond that, you know, small ownership stakes in African production houses, African musical entities, you know, script writing. I think there are ways that you can creatively sell off pieces of your IP or put them on loan, if you will, to that investor that they feel a tangible asset in their hands, that they know there's some bankability, you know, that there is a that there is a commodity driven approach to this. So I think to answer her question, I think it's a really interesting space that hasn't really been discussed in the impact of Web3 blockchain has on the creative industries, both from an ownership structure and an IP representation that needs to be explored a little bit more. Uh, and perhaps um, through this task force, Rama and team can can analyze how that will have a, a really positive impact, especially knowing that many of these people that are generating a really amazing assets um, are youthful, that they don't have access to the formal markets and perhaps blockchain and, and the assets around the blockchain will provide that venue to the formal market in a more constructive way. But really uh, excited to be part of this task force and the thought leadership here and look forward to partnering uh, with our friends from AFTB and old friends like Mamadou and others uh, on how do we strengthen the ties between U.S. financial institutions and African ones to support the creative industry. Thank you very much, Pat. I know you have to jump uh, uh, very shortly. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank you for, for, your, for your insights and, 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 and thank you for your time. Uh, and just uh, I'm going to maybe Dr. Fofak wanted to add a few points uh, earlier on. Dr. Fofak, before we maybe conclude with uh, uh, an, a point Solomon wanted to come back to, um, you wanted to add a few points on, 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 on an early subject. No, no, thank you um, very much, moderator. I think to go back to the point of, it's very important for us, I fully concur, to be very um, clear about this and emphasize the return on investment to make sure that we're actually getting into bank capital. But we also know very well that it is a very complex industry 
where there is an emotional component that we have to manage. We've gone through a cycle whereby we have great movies which were actually turned down by product by producer, major producer, which have gone on to be very successful because perhaps a venture angel actually decided to take a risk on it because the proper channel could not really provide for it. We've also gone through a cycle whereby uh, we know very well that there is a good movie out there, but those who own the cinema, the movie theater, are actually not providing the opportunity for it to be channel to the public and the big users. I think in the digital space, some of that will be addressed. It's very important for us to have really an ecosystem approach to this, to have a very an integrated approach to this, to mitigate some of the risk that could be associated with really basing our assessment on one particular agent. And that's why at Africa Same Bank actually have really a very comprehensive a value chain approach to this. We are involved not just in financing, but also in marketing and distributions, in publishing, and as well as really in the productions of talent, including going as far as the production academy, building on our partnership with other institutions, not just in the continent, but also in the US. I think, uh, that Scott is gone, I think we've actually been engaging a lot of producer within the US to work with us to bring that talent within the continent and to actually prepare young African artists to get in that industry, not just as creator, but also as business owner and managers. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Fofai. Um, maybe we'll have a few words uh, to conclude with TDB. Before, before we jump to that, I wanted to give the floor to Solomon. Solomon, you wanted to come back to uh, a point about uh, uh, the incubator uh, kind of model thing. Um, can you uh, just clarify on that? What 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 do you what 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 did you want to to um, to add to, to to that point? Oh no no. So Mamadou, I think I think you saw my message a little late. I, I've already clarified. Okay. When I, when I expanded on the example of what we're doing in the creative industries in Nigeria, uh, the ecosystem approach. But but let me let me Nita, that's exactly what we're 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 doing. Uh, we are we're creating a Pan-African you know platform. Uh, we call it the Center of Excellence for the Youth Entrepreneurship Investment Bank. And and you know, on this platform, uh, the youth entrepreneurs will be able to transact with each other across the continent. Uh, in addition, they could also even do some mergers, you know, um, or, or, or some strategic alliances as well. And then in terms of the U.S. investors, you know, these are early stage, you know, companies, Mamadou. I mean, one of the things that we're trying to do, the concept of the Youth Entrepreneurship Investment Bank is not to hold on to clients forever, okay, but it's to actually make those clients available to the right investor at the different stages of the entrepreneur's life. So we're going to be accumulating a lot of data. So big data and data mining, you know, um, is going to be an important part of, of, of this Pan-African platform. And, you know, in recent conversations with AFRIEXIM and also the CFTA Secretariat's uh, Secretary General, I mean, what we said was, you know, maybe there's no need for AFDB to create that, you know, electronic platform. Let's overlay this on, on the platform that AFRIEXIM has already uh, created, whether it's for PAPS, the Gateway Program, you know, et cetera. So, so you know, that's something we're, we're looking at. Um, I, I know Scott said we shouldn't only focus on the big countries when it comes to creative industries, but if we use the principle by which we, we are encouraging the CFTA, not every country needs to produce the same thing. So I think it's better for us to really focus on the countries where the opportunities are great initially. And then we would actually, I mean, then all of a sudden the U, for the US investor, uh, they see a demonstration of return in the places where you have critical mass, then they will be more comfortable going into uh, the next phase of countries really at, at the later point. So for the creative industries, I think encouraging US investments, especially around venture capital, is a key opportunity. But the other investor that will be key would be what I call the strategic investors. So that's the Netflix, the Sonys, the others, 
Um, you know, and, and, and even on the sports side, you know, I remember I used to cover a company called SFX Entertainment in New York, and, and they really focused on stadiums, you know, whether it, it was for American football or basketball, you know, they did all the advertising and so on, and, and they found ways to really monetize. I mean, we need to bring those strategic investors in so that all of a sudden we have a value chain of, of businesses really around, you know, that, you know, the entertainment space. You asked about a secondary market. Um, you know, I, I think, for example, if, if actually, you know, if Afri Exxon's film funding uh, is coming to scale, uh, there could be actually, and, and the library has value. I mean, my assumption here is that uh, they hold on to the, you know, the library as, you know, collateral or, or they acquire the libraries, you know, from these uh, film producers, you know, if it has value. There could be a secondary market because there will be established, you know, stable cash flows. And that would be another way to bring, uh, you know, the U.S. in. And, and, and lastly, Ambassador Rama, um, the Africa Investment Forum is going to be a great counterpart, you know, for the Atl Atlantic Council. It's a very transactional platform. I know December 1st to 3rd, uh, we were actually going to feature uh, a creative industries uh, venture capital fund. Uh, founded by um, a young lady named uh, Roberta Annan. Uh, she was going to be really part of the boardrooms uh, that we're having. Uh, so the Africa Investment Forum is, is, is you know, in which AfriX and TDB and all the others are partners uh, would be an excellent forum, you know, as well to showcase, uh, you know, transactional opportunities in the creative industry space. Uh, sorry, Mamadou, I, I hope I didn't take too much time. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Salomon. And I, I actually, uh, I'm in that platform. It's a very, it's a very important tool. And I think we had to, uh, it's going to be expanded on, on, on being able to collect also some uh, very vital data about uh, the investment uh, uh, sector, investment fee in, the, in, in, in Africa. Uh, I wanted to know um, who's in actually for TDB because uh, uh, we wanted to include uh, TDB in discussion. Um, I haven't been able to uh, uh, to get the name of uh, the person who actually uh, joined for TDB. Uh, what was the late call? But I, I wanted to say something, and, and Scott didn't really answer my um, question. Mamadou, excuse me to interrupt you, but I think at some point we have to conclude uh, because the the. Even if the, the space is virtual, uh, we have a limited time, so. <laughs> Absolutely. So we, we're going to conclude on that. I just wanted to, to mention uh, the question asked to Scott. And uh, uh, we, 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 we uh, I think at the end of the day, this work is going to end up with policy recommendation to uh, the president of the, UA, the United States. And what can we recommend uh, to, to, to the president? And what is going to be our goal uh, besides uh, growing the creative sectors, uh, industries in, in Africa is also to, to strengthen uh, US-Africa economic relations and to get US investors more involved into uh, the African economies. So what type of mechanism can we find to make the USA uh, have a stronger backing of institutions like AFDB, of institutions like uh, uh, Africzim Bank, and also Africa Guarantee Fund, on a scale that is going to make a difference for developing and, and, and boosting the private sectors. But something that we have to think about collectively, and this will be the take the form of policy recommendation that uh, uh, Ambassador Rama will, will have to, to put forward to, to the highest level in, in, uh, 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 at the presidency of the USA. So I think it's, it's really interesting to have started this conversation with uh, those different uh, uh, ideas that have been floated around and how can we make this useful going forward uh, so that we have better means and stronger means and more capacity to, 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 to develop all those initiatives we have mentioned here is something very critical. I leave the floor maybe to Ambassador Rama to conclude. It has been a very interesting and uh, uh, useful uh, exchange. So, so Rama, the floor is yours. 
Yes, um, thank you. Thank you so much, Mamadou, for uh, the talented way you uh, took uh, the best from our, our esteemed guest. Uh, I'm sure everyone uh, has uh, appreciated. Thank you, dear guests, for sharing your expertise, learnings, and the best of your ideas and recommendations in order to improve uh, uh, the financial engineering of the creative sector in, in Africa. Um, dear audience, I hope you... I, I hope you have understood that behind the entertainment, uh, creative industries in Africa is about investment, economic impact, job creation, soft power. And like I previously said, we will meet again to continue this conversation, hopefully with IEF. Uh, uh, Salomon uh, mentioned IEF, uh, one of our important partners. So uh, of course, um, all of you and others like TDB, uh, another partner of uh, the Africa Center too. Um, from all uh, these thoughts, we envision to deliver, of course, a powerful strategy of recommendations at the end of the year um, to the highest levels of uh, multilateral and pan-African leaderships uh, during the second edition of uh, the Summit of Washington, um, still in 2022. Uh, by then, we will roll out our Africa Creative um, Program um, during the following um, year beyond the task force and a major policy report. We are starting to work on um, at the Council with our other partner, the Policy Center for the New South, who will launch a, a business for a series uh, on each creative sector every two months. Um, fashion, music, movies, you know, all these sectors uh, mentioned by you. The first one, like I said, will be a sports business forum in Dakar uh, during the Basketball Africa uh, League on March 4th in the Museum of Black Civilizations um, of the Senegalese capital. Our other partner, Maza, uh, is already at work on a market survey about the economic impact of sports. Uh, we hope to see you there uh, or virtually. Uh, the president of Senegal and current president of the African Union will be there too. So uh, thank you. Uh, stay tuned and uh, see you very soon on the Atlantic Council's platforms. Recording stopped. <laughs>